Lattimore Peace, host and producer of Omni U Presents the H3O Art of Life show, Hotep. I have a guest that I have been trying to get on, on this stage across from me so I could talk to him for forever. And in fact, he has been hiding in plain sight because he is a WVON Talk of Chicago a talk show host and everybody talks to him but I was not able to when I wanted to but now I have Salim Moakil. Yes, I love it I'm so happy to greet you the pleasure absolutely is mine Dr. well Peace. I'm glad because I'm just so thrilled you know I, I want you to tell people more about yourself because you do all the listening you know, people call in and tell you everything they want to say. So now I want you to tell the viewers everything you want to say. Mm. Well, oh. um, <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a native of New York City, born in Harlem, um, and uh, moved to Jersey when it, while I was a teenager and um, came up in that part of the world. Went into the Air Force. Well, before I did that, I also... Um, I think I, I probably participated in some of the most iconic events of the period. I went to the uh, March on Washington in 63 with, with uh, four other brothers. We drove down from uh, New Jersey to D.C. Um, and, uh, you know, I was there. I wasn't there for the civil rights uh, aspect of it. We heard there would be a lot of women there, so that, that's, that was our motivation. Um, it turned out to be absolutely true, you know. A lot of, a lot of, in fact, I'm still in touch with a lot, of, a lot of the sisters that I met there. But I bumped into the civil rights movement, got a little spirit of activism. Um, the next year, <clears throat> I was there when, when the uh, first long, hot summer riots popped off in Harlem in 64. Mm -hmm. My cousin got shot in, the, in that riot, and it was very upsetting to me in many ways, so I um, kind of jumped out of the frying pan into the fire, joined the service during the Vietnam era. Uh, and so I spent four years in the military um, uh, where I was radicalized. This was a time when a lot of black servicemen were becoming radicalized, this Vietnam uh, era. Um, I also got shot uh, during my last year, but not in, not in, not in any kind of a military skirmish. I got shot in Georgia by a white guy um, in a hotel, which further radicalized me. Um, and as soon as I left the service in, in uh, 69, I had to stay in about six, six months past my uh, regular uh, discharge date because I was re re recuperating from the, from the gunshot. Um, but as soon as I got out of the service, I joined the Black Panther Party. I had been that radicalized. I didn't even go home. As soon as I got out of the airport, I went straight to the Panther office in Jersey City at the time. And so I became a, a member of the Black Panthers um, uh, from 69 to about 71, uh, doing a lot of stuff, um, some good, some not repeatable, um, and <clears throat> continued to study and whatnot, and, and became a little bit disenchanted with what the Panthers were up to because there seemed to be a lot of um, a, a sense of uh, uh, s simply letting off steam. We, we were, uh, rather, than, um, rather than systematically doing something for our people, we were, it was very contingent. You know, our, our, our uh, fundraising technique was basically um, trying to trying to convince store owners to uh, donate to our cause or, or their store would, would burn down the next day. That, that kind of uh, um, uh, unsustainable fundraising techniques. And, and, and I saw, as, as I was participating in all of that, we were next door to, a, to a, um, an establishment that was run by the Nation of Islam. And the contrast between what the Nation of Islam was doing and what a lot of the, uh, the revolutionary 
um, activists at the time were doing was pretty stark. The nation was real serious, but not so, um, uh, they, they were not getting involved in, in the kind of uh, um, adventurous and, and, and media friendly activity that a lot of the uh, other folks were. They were just seriously going about their business, building other institutions. We were protesting about uh, inattention in, in, in the curriculum to, to black issues they were creating their own curriculum. And soon that, that um, style, that method, seemed to be the superior method to me. And I, and I began turning more and more toward the Nation of Islam um, till I eventually became a member of the nation. Uh, and this was during the period also when I had been hired by the Associated Press. I was going to school at the time, Rutgers University in Jersey, which I had gotten a into because of my Air Force service. Um, they paid really all, all of the tuition and whatnot. So I did get something out of the service after getting shot and, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and so I, I joined the, uh, the Nation of Islam while I was working for the Associated Press. The Associated Press n were lo located in Newark, New Jersey, which had a population of about 65% black. They didn't have any black reporters. The Kerner Commission had, had um, absolutely excoriated the media for being basically an apartheid institution. And so the media was scrambling to hire black reporters wherever they could get them. I think in Chicago they hired guys right after, like Rush Ewing, he was a fireman. Uh, Warner Saunders was a member of the uh, Black Boys uh, Foundation, uh, I mean the uh, Better Boys Foundation. And, um, so he became a reporter. So I mean, that kind of thing, they, they were rather desperate. They just wanted someone who was relatively literate, someone black who was, rel and so I got hired right out of, high, right out of uh, college, right out of Rutgers. Um, and so I was working for the AP, becoming deeply involved in the Nation of Islam at the time. And, um, uh, and, <clears throat> and then I started writing for Muhammad Speaks. I started doing stringing. For, for Muhammad Speaks from the East Coast. I started, I was actually the, the uh, official, official um, Newark uh, correspondent for, for, for Muhammad Speaks during this period, um, even as I was writing for the Associated Press. I would write a piece for the, for the AP. I would go home at night, transform myself to, you know, to this uh, raging black Muslim, and then, and then rewrite the article from the perspective of African Americans. And so really it gave me a discipline a, a kind of a, a systematic understanding of how mainstream uh, perspectives differed from the perspectives of, of uh, you know, that were most, that were most, beneficial, to, most beneficial to black people. Um, and so I did that for a while, those, those kinds of pieces. In fact, I, I did a piece um, when um, Asata Shakur, Joanne Chesman, I knew Joanne from my period in the Panthers. We had meetings in New York at, at the City, uh, City College of New York, CCNY. But um, my editors assigned me to this crash that had happened on, on, on the Turnpike in Jersey, and I found out it was, it was uh, uh, Joanne, who was Asada Shakur by then, a member of the Black Liberation Army, which was, a, which was the Panther Party in another iteration. Um, and so I, I, uh, I went and I covered that, and I wrote about it, for the AP, I tried to insert the, the very clear uh, knowledge that forensic evidence did not implicate her as, as one of the shooters, but I couldn't get that into my story. And, and I became increasingly disenchanted with, with the AP because of that um, and, 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 got, and became very dedicated to writing pieces for, for Muhammad Speaks. And then eventually, one day I got a call um, on my phone in Jersey uh, a sister named Valora Najib, who was the personal secretary to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, called me. And when I heard her name, my heart stopped because she was famous in the nation as being the secretary of, of, uh, of the, of the uh, messenger. And then I heard a voice, brother, I heard that you uh, want to help us build a nation. And I recognized instantly that was uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And, uh, so as soon as I hung up, 
at, almost before I hung up, my foot was out the door on my way to Chicago. <laughs> And so I, I came to Chicago. I was in 73, the, the, the last part of 73. And I quit AP right away, put on my clothes, and, and, and hightailed it to Chicago. Um, and then eventually I moved my family and blah, blah, blah. And I've been here ever since. Um, I started out with Muhammad Speaks as a news editor. Uh, I was there when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died. Um, I, did, I went a lot, you know, I did a lot of traveling before that. I went to Jamaica with Muhammad Ali. I went to um, uh, Manila. I went to uh, Uganda with, with uh, Minister Farrakhan when, when, they, when they, we visited the OAU conference um, in, in 75 when, when Idi Amin was the chairman. So I, you know, I did the, the tour of Uganda with, with Idi Amin. I went back the next year, as a matter of fact, in 76. Uh, and, and traveled all throughout East Africa and Egypt. Uh, and, and so uh, eventually I, I, I left the, the uh, world community of Islam. I uh, just, you know, went into a different direction. I found different belief systems more compatible. And I started writing for other publications. Um, uh, Mostly progressive, like what, progr like the reader. I, I was doing a lot of stuff with the reader at the time. A lot of uh, iconoclastic articles. I, that's kind of, you know, that was kind of my uh, specialty. I was trying to be, trying to find stories that other, other folks wouldn't deal with. Like I, I had a cover story on what color was Christ in, in the reader, which was, you know, rather pathbreaking for, for a publication like that. that was, the, sto the story was dealing with uh, Wallace Muhammad and his intention to, to um, question the prevalence of white images of divinity in, in, in a religious institutions, like white pictures of Christ, and what, what effect did that have on black worshipers? Uh, did it have a, an unconscious effect, the, the white supremacist aspect of it? Um, and that was the, the basis of the article, but I did it in a way that, that, um, that brought a lot of different elements into it. And so the read, I became one of the reader's favorite um, writers for those kinds of subjects, and I did a lot of that. And then I started writing, I got picked up, I did a lot of uh, freelancing at the time as well. A lot of freelancing, I wrote for Washington Post, uh, New York Times, I, I, I did a um, review of um, James Baldwin's, um, uh, his last book, um, The Price of the Ticket, for the New York Times. Um, and I, I, I've done I, I used to specialize in book reviews. I did a lot for Sun Times, Washington Post, and and that was kind of my niche, the kind of intellectual journalism. And I, that's what it, really what I've been doing. I, I started writing a column for the Sun Times in um, '94, uh, and I did that until '97, and then in '98 I started for the Tribune writing a column, and I did that until 2003. And so that's, and, and all, during all that period, I was um, a senior editor for a publication called In These Times, uh, which is a kind of a non-sectarian, left-leaning, um, progressive publication that's been around now for, you know, for a long time and, and is doing better than ever right now. Uh, and I'm, I'm still there. I'm senior editor there, as well as, um, you know, occasional uh, freelancer for other publications. I do the, the radio show on on VON, and that's me. Well, you can't stop saying I do a radio show on <laughs> VON <laughs> because that right now is your claim to fame yes. in my part of the world. Yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. So yes. tell me about that. How did that come about? And well, you know, what I, do you find fulfilling in that? I love, I love doing it. I mean, um, I started actually in in seven in ninety three. I was doing a Sunday show. Um, for VON. Wesley South hired me. He wanted me to do some journalistic reflections on the news, it's, it's a lot of uh, foreign policy issues, because I've had a, um, I used to do a lot of foreign policy columns for, for the Sun-Times and the Trib. That has been my interest since the Air Force. I was my training in the Air Force. Um, as uh, um, I was working in intelligence, uh, as a radio intelligence uh, interpreter, and so I would have to be very 
knowledgeable on um, what, what was going on in the so-called behind the Iron Curtain. And I used to analyze a lot of that, that kind of stuff. And, it, and that became something that I, that I, that I was fond of and, and pretty, um, pretty good at. And, and so um, that, was, that, that was what uh, Mr. South wanted me to do. And, and I did that for a while there, I think three years. And then, I, and then a gospel show took over. It was on a Sunday night. Uh, and so then, I, and then um, when, when Vioen moved to the new location, uh, I got a call again. Um, did I want to do a show? Kind of the same thing, um, uh, uh, digesting the news, international news, in a way that made it a lot more relevant and, and interesting to, to uh, African Americans in the city. <clears throat> and also, um, w w the way I look at it is it, it's, um, it's kind of an a improvisational show. I like to s simply let the callers um, set the tone. Whatever, wherever they go, I, I try to be uh, informed enough to be able to be able to go there with them and and to uh, provide some context for for what they're saying. So it requires me to always be aware of what's going on in the world because I never know what they're going to bring up. And that's the way I, I like to to operate. Uh, on How the long show. have you been operating like that? Ten years. WVON. Ten years uh, on yeah. in this particular iteration. And I used to do. I started out on Saturdays. Uh, for a while, I was doing Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays as well. Um, and, and eventually, you know, and it changed over time, and sometimes it went up and sometimes it went down. And now I'm just doing Saturdays, which is fine with me. Well, it's fine with me. You know, there are just so many things that you, you brought to mind. Uh, I claimed this, that this show was going to be combat zones, foreign and domestic, and it may be, but mostly what I wanted it to be was Salim, because I've been wanting to have, you know, this, 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 I've had this interest in knowing from whence you come, because you're such an interesting person. You, first of all, caught my attention with having been shot while you were in the military, yes, but not in combat. <laughs> right. So I think <laughs> if you can give us a little bit more background on that, it would clear that up, because I know my viewers are sitting out there trying to work that out. Well, un unfortunately, it's not, a, it's, not that much, it's not so much of a noble story. <laughs> it was, um, uh, you know, a, a, as many, many um, servicemen do, I was... Uh, on on the uh, chase of, of of women, females. You know that's basically what we do in our off-duty time. And um, there was a young lady from New York City who was visiting Georgia. This part I was since I was stationed in Georgia, uh, a part a part of Georgia called Warner Robins, right outside of Macon. And um, this New York um, sister was in town, and everyone was was bidding for her attention. I was bidding as well, and being from New York, I had a you know kind of a, a inside, inside track. <laughs> exactly mm -hmm. right. So um, we wound up at a friend's house uh, and and uh, had a good time, and we were going to a hotel. Yeah. After after all of that, and um, you know th this was a hotel that a lot of a lot of servicemen would go to and. And so it was pretty well known. And, and when I went in there, the, the um, uh, manager gave me a price that I thought was excessive. And I was, um, rather, I was just a foolish service guy. Uh, I was a, a foolish airman, uh, had drunk a little bit too much. I was protesting against uh, what, what I considered an inflation, an, an, you know, instant inflation of the price. I started using words like that that indicated I was I was not from the area that I was northern I was just saying black at the time black was controversial to say mm -hmm. this was 68 in Georgia yeah um the same year M Martin Luther King was shot right in Georgia in, in not in Georgia but in, in a hotel as well right um and uh so I, I said the wrong thing I was too I was too obsequious uh, I mean I, I was too uh, obstinate you know I, I was too I got into his 
into his face a bit too much. And um, the, the manager just pulled out a 38 uh, and, and shot me, you know. Uh, and uh, so it was, in a lot of ways, it was, it was my fault. I was a little bit too, uh, 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 too aggressive. And, and this, was a, this was Georgia. I had been influenced by mil black militants. Um, Martin Luther King had been shot earlier. We had, we had marched on the base when that happened, talking about umgawa black power, umgawa black power. And, and, and so I, I, I was um, punished for my, for my obstinance. Uh, my boys, though, you know, they burned down his joint <laughs> right after that happened. I heard later, you know, I, I was in the hospital. It was pretty serious. I was shot in the abdomen with a 38. Uh, I had to stay in the hospital for six months um, to, to recuperate. Well, you know, my read on that would be that um, you're taking far too much responsibility for what happened because you ought to be able to protest if you think that you're being treated unfairly, especially if you think that, that as you p mentioned, the price was unduly inflated. Um, and, you know, all of the other stuff, you know, I think we have this kind of penchant to try to figure out what we did wrong when, when we are wronged. Um, and that's, you know, that's a good practice when it comes to automobile accidents. You know, if you get in an automobile accident, they want to know how much of it was your fault, mm -hmm. how much of it was the other driver's fault. But I think that, you know, our place in the society always makes it suspect to me that, you know, something that we did led to our being discriminated against, mm -hmm. led to our being... Um, uh, uh, offended, insulted, taken for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that sometimes our knee-jerk reaction is from the standpoint of being human beings who don't like to be violated. Absolutely. And if we sense violation, we respond, and we tend to respond vehemently. Yes. So, you know... I, I forgive you, you know, and, and it, because it could have been worse. You know, Ooh, you, could, you could not have survived that, and Absolutely. then we wouldn't be able to sit here and ask you to tell us some stories about you. See, I'm seeing you graduating because you're saying, well, I went over here, and I, I was with this, and this was, this was who I was, and then I observed something else, that appeared to be more in sync with who I saw myself as being. And then at some point, I outgrew or graduated from that, which is, for me, a sign of very great intelligence to know and not be hypocritical, to know when you are out of, out of, out of congruity with mm. the situation that you're in and not to stay in it and pretend that you are still with it when in fact you are not. So very, very, very good, very good. That's habit, for me, that's an integrity. But I, I like the fact that, that, you know, you have had all these experiences, especially as a journalist, because when you tell me you've been writing from all these different perspectives mm -hmm. based upon where you were, were and what the subject matter was and now that you have a radio station you're listening and you're trying to be sufficiently informed to relate to whatever the position is that the caller has. How do you avoid getting into a one-on-one -on -one dispute with a caller because sometimes I've heard people say stuff and I just you know I would have taken them on. <laughs> Uh, right, and uh, I, I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's difficult, and sometimes I don't, I don't succeed. Sometimes I, I get drawn into it. But, you know, with the kind of wide variety of experiences that I've had, and previously being convinced of one way, and then coming to a conclusion that that way had some limitations. You know, like the, well, at one point, the nation, I mean, the uh, Black Panther Party was the absolute answer. I, I didn't see anything. Were you on the west side with the Black Panther Party? No, no, Party? I was in, in Jersey. 
Oh, mm -hmm. you so you weren't anywhere near. I Fred wasn't in Hampton. Chicago. No, no. Okay. We we heard of Fred, okay. you know, and he was he was a, a an icon to us. Okay. But, okay. but um, I was in, I was on the East Coast at that time. Okay. Um, and especially when when the Panthers broke uh, when, when Elridge Cleaver became a member and, and broke it and, and it was really beyond Elridge Cleaver, but he is the one who precipitated the the the, the split to when when uh, the East Coast. Panthers became the Black Liberation Army. They went underground, mm -hmm. and the West Coast Panthers, the Panthers became more electorally oriented. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Seale ran for mayor and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, and this was during that period. But the Pan, I began to see that the Panthers really, a lot of the Panthers were cath was catharsis, and that was, you know, that was necessary. We needed catharsis, mm -hmm. but it's limited. It has a limited application, and and I saw the Nation of Islam as being much more serious about and disciplined, and disciplined about uh, mm -hmm. how to how to achieve liberation for our people. Mm -hmm. And the Panthers were talking about um, a revolutionary personality that um, that we needed a, a, a change in the mode of production so that it would create a revolutionary personality. Uh, and and the Nation of Islam was creating that really mm -hmm. through, from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And it has seemed to me that that was the most logical way to mm -hmm. go. And, and I did move, I did graduate, as you point out, matriculate, I guess you can say, mm -hmm. from the Panthers to the nation. Um, although I never really rejected the Panthers, I still mm -hmm. I understood their right. attraction and whatnot, but I, I went into a different uh, direction. And then in the nation, you know, I, I, um, when, when Warith Muhammad um, took over, I thought it was really about time mm -hmm. because, and, and many former members, uh, mem many members who, who had been nurtured by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad also reasoned that um, it was time to graduate to, a, to a, the second resurrection is what, what we called it at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. um, but then, um, you know, you, you did see a lot, of, a lot of people regress, the lack of discipline, the, the lack of a, a strict code of discipline allowed mm -hmm. people to, um, to, to, to uh, <laughs> you know, to go back, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, to, to, to drift back into the dead world, as mm -hmm. we would say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I can, I, I, when I went to um, Uganda with Minister Farrakhan, we went under the regime of Wallace Muhammad. This is, Elijah Muhammad had just died in 75, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we went to Uganda that summer, 75. And, and Minister Farrakhan at that time was, was under the guidance of, of Wallace Muhammad, and he was trying to reconcile his former position. Even at the time, you could mm -hmm. tell he was having some, some problems trying mm -hmm. to reconcile it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, even, but he had concluded that perhaps it was time for, for graduation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, new, a new way of looking at Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he later changed his mind after seeing so many other brothers who couldn't handle that kind of freedom, I mm -hmm. think. Is, you know, it's my own, my own speculation as to right. why he decided to right. go back. Um, right. And he's, he's performed, a, some would say, a miracle by re reviving the nation in the right. way he did. Yeah. Right. Well, I think that, you know, organizations are made of, of, of human beings. Yes. You know, and they have human attributes. And not all of them can remain constant and steadfast. Uh, and some of them do backslide, as we would say in the in the in the church. Right. Uh, and what it, there's nothing that you can do about that except that you need to always have young people in the organization who can carry on whatever the ideals are of the people who founded the organization. Mm -hmm if the organization's mission is going to be carried out, which is another matter, because sometimes people join for reasons other than that's, to fulfill a mission. Uh, some people join because there are good-looking women there. Some people, <laughs> some, some people. That was, a pan that was one of the Panthers' problems as well. You know, it became hip, you know, chic. Right. And that, that beret and that stylish. Right, right, thing, right, know. right. So they, now these are appealing, these, these are brothers who seem like they got their act together. They got a vision of where they going, you know, and they strong and they virulent and they taking care of the children. And look at the press. 
You know what was in the press. You were writing in the mm. press. Yes. You know, black men were next to nothing on Absolutely. the scale of social beings. Still, it's still, it's still hard to get good, good press for, for black men, in, in, except in, in athletics and, and uh, you know, entertainment. Right. What, in these times, what do you write? Uh, well, do you ever have to address any of the social issues affecting our people? All the time. That's, that's my specialty. Really. Okay, tell me something recent. Uh, recently, uh, I, I wrote a piece on reparations. Um, okay, what's your what's your position? Well, I, I'm, I've been I've been, you know, my first piece on that was pro reparations was in 1993 for Sun oh, Times. You've been out there a long time. Yeah, I, I did a 93 piece for the Sun Times. You know, I met uh, Queen Mother Moore was in, with was with us in, in in Uganda that time, as a matter of fact. Does <laughs> anybody not know? You don't have to be from New York. <laughs> you no, know, everyone knows. How does she become? I, we had to sidetrack. How did Queen Mother Moore become Queen Mother Moore, such a revered Amazing. person? And, and, and the thing is, is everyone knew her in Uganda, not just Americans, mm -hmm. but Africans knew her. She was, she was I mean, she was a revered uh, person. We had a, we had a, you know, I'll never forget, this is really my first time sitting down with her. We had a, at the, uh, I'm trying to think of the hotel, Palm Hotel. Um, uh, that's not the name, but we, we were sitting down in the hotel in Uganda. And, we, and what our discussion was about how the, the vegetation in Uganda seemed to be animate. It was so vibrant. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be animate. It seemed like the plants were whispering. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and we, we were marveling at that, and that was our conversation. I'll never mm -hmm. forget that, me and mm -hmm. Queen Mother Moore. But yeah, but, but so, I mean, I've been acquainted with the reparations argument f okay. for a while. Okay. Um, and I've been pushing it for a while. It okay. seems to me that, it, that it's intellectual malfeasance not to push it for any, 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 anyone who's really studied our issues. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's the obvious, one of the obvious answers to, to the problems we have. I agree, but then I think it's almost fruitless it it seems futile which doesn't it doesn't mean that you don't try to do something because it appears that you cannot succeed at doing it because otherwise uh, most of us wouldn't have done anything uh, because the odds always seem so great and so the cards always seem to be stacked against us but it it's very very difficult for me to think of how you can actually quantify what is owed to the dehumanization mm. of an entire people. It yes. just, you know, how, how I would accept that check, you know, is, it was difficult for me because I wouldn't want the perpetrators of this oppression to feel that they had paid their debt because right. they cannot repay the debt. So what is it that we would like to have? We would like for them to just do a token acknowledgement of the damage that they have done to our people um, by putting, uh, putting a number on it and, and I just don't know what to do with it. I just know that, you know, we, if you could unring the bell, they just needed not to come and to us, <laughs> you know, and, and impose their, their worldview and, and their culture and their, their, their quest for imperialism on us. They just needed to stay where they were and do that to their to their own people. Well, but, I, I got you, I got you. But you know, here we are, and oh. and we, you know, um, the argument is just so is just so um, overwhelming. Uh, the logic is overwhelming to favoring reparations. That regardless of the the plausibility of, right. of it being implemented, I right. think we have an obligation to make the point and. Who knows about the plausibility? I mean, I didn't think it would be possible, and I'm sure you didn't either, that we would have a black president. Right. Uh, and, and, and although we see in retrospect that that wasn't such a, 
that wasn't such a grand occasion, but but at the same time, it was symbolically significant. Right. And, um, well, here. you know, the thing is, if the Japanese people were given reparations for the crimes against them, mm -hmm. uh, then certainly we no less deserve. Absolutely. Uh, because the, their, the crime against them had a, a, a starting point and an end point. You know, theirs didn't go down through centuries. Right. Um, so that it, 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 you could say that um, and, and, and it's it, based on that, you know, the fact that you do give reparations to people you have harmed and you need. But then, of course, the argument was that slavery was legal because it had not, it was part of the law. Mm. It was it had not been outlawed. So it was legal. So no damage was done to black people uh, because it was. It was lawful mm -hmm. to own people. What do you do with that argument? Well, um, the UN ha has declared slavery a crime against humanity, and there's no, there is no, absolutely no um, statute of limitation on any crime against okay. humanity. Okay, so so that's taking, you couldn't, you couldn't, it, you couldn't make it lawful just because you, you use practice that. it. That's right. Okay. Um, and and um, you know, it, it is the, the the situation is is that uh, I mean it, it would be akin to, let, let's say, the Marshall Plan um, a, after World War II, when, when this country uh, delivered outright currency transfers to, to former enemies, mm -hmm. as well as our allies, mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and uh, without any questions asked. Mm -hmm. they didn't ask them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Mm -hmm. That was only after two and a half years of, mm -hmm. of, of combat. Um, Germany is still paying reparations to Israel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the Nazi experience. Um, and, and so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a principle that's well established in international, mm -hmm. international uh, discourse. And so, uh, I, it seems to me like there's really no argument uh, for it, uh, against it. Uh, and uh, we do, if anyone, if there's any group of people who are deserving of it, it is, it is us. And I think it, it, could, be, it, it could be encapsulated in, in a sort of Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, system. Well, I, uh, let, me, let me be clear that I am in favor of our people being compensated to the fullest extent possible for the crimes against our people. Absolutely right. I just don't think there's enough money on the planet to do it, and I don't think there's a, there's a will that's, on the part yeah, that's what it is, will. of other people to do it. But when I look at, if I just look at the circumstances on which, under which the ma majority of us live right now, we could just le use some relief for right now. You know, people are struggling. Struggling. Everywhere struggling. you look, they're trying to make ends meet. Um, we don't have to cite all the unemployment rate and the, all the things that say that people lack revenue, they lack, they lack resources, the, the, home, the foreclosures of homes, the people who never owned homes in the first place, the people, the, the, the families who are living together because they can't live separately, mm -hmm. you know, grown children who are still at home because they, even though they have been to college, they can't find employment in the out in the real world mm -hmm. and so consequently they can't support themselves so they're trying to be adults in the homes of other people mm. trying to be independent while being dependent at the same pl time which is an oxymoron because you can't be those two things in the same person but the when when you if we just had just some relief from the daily oppression of living while black. Yes, ma'am. You know, if you, didn't, if you didn't go back anywhere, if you didn't go back to the period during our captivity, if you didn't go back, in, if you just started with right now, get this monkey, uh, get, this, <laughs> <laughs> get this elephant, you know, off us. Yes, man. I mean, and, and that's, that's really, it's the legacy of slavery. Right. That's really what it is. Right. Well, one thing, um, 
in, in, in 2014, was it 14 or 15? I think it was 14. Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote that piece about reparations in the uh, Atlantic. You, com you commented on that. You want to say something about that? I, I do. I mean, I think, I, I think that he... I saw you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's, um, I mean, he, I, I, I really respect his, his, his skill, his writing mm -hmm. skills. And he made, an, he made an impeccable case for reparations. And he didn't even go back to slavery. Mm -hmm. He was only going to talking about the... the the, the period of, of uh, right after World War II, um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, housing situation mm -hmm. in Chicago and how mm -hmm. that alone mm -hmm. is, 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 um, is justification for mm -hmm. uh, uh, reparatory, reparatory uh, justice mm -hmm. um, and uh, reparatory justice. And, and, and so he made the case really um, uh, with, with kind of an extraordinary argument uh, justifying that. Mm -hmm. And that's not even going back, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, start at any point in history. At any point in history, you know, that legacy is is heavy, mm -hmm. and it weighs mm -hmm. on us, and, and and it has a lot of effects. I think one of the effects it has, and I speak on this quite a bit, is it, it's restricted our cultural capital. And what I mean by that is is um, other people have ways of behaving, values that are that are um, imbued by their families and whatnot that encourage success, ways of behaving that, that uh, lead them towards success because, mm -hmm. because of the way, in the way they move in the world. Mm -hmm. We have not had the ability to do that because we've always been on the edge of survival. Mm -hmm. We've never had the opportunity mm -hmm. to develop those kind of skills. Mm -hmm. That's why immigrants come here and, and jump over us because they've had that opportunity in their own indi indigenous societies mm -hmm. to develop those skills. We because we've been, we've been deprived of our own cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. We've been socialized for subservience for mm -hmm. the most part. Um, we've never had that ability to acquire those cultural skills. And mm -hmm. that is extremely important. When, when, we, we'll do it, though. We, we have the organic vitality to do it if we have the, just the smallest opportunity. We mm -hmm. did it, we did it in, in, in uh, Greenwood. It, we, we did it in Rosewood, in mm -hmm. Greenwood, um, uh, Oklahoma. We did it in Rosewood, Florida. We did it mm -hmm. in many, many small towns around America mm -hmm. when we had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we don't get that opportunity. Mm -hmm. we, it threatens white people. Right. Uh, like, uh, again, Tana Hasi says, you know, uh, the, the, his, he has a new book. It's called Eight Years in Power. And it was talking about this guy... Um, during the Reconstruction period, mm -hmm. who uh, in South Carolina, a black uh, congressman who said, "Why are you taking? Why? Why is the, the Redeemers coming to take away the power of, of, of black folks that we gained during Reconstruction? Because South Carolina, for example, um, benefited from, right. from our government. It was good Negro government. Right, right. Uh, but uh, but the point is, is that's what white people are afraid of. It's right. good Negro government because mm -hmm. it, it undermines white supremacy on right. every level. How can you claim to be superior? Exactly right. If the people who you're claiming are inferior exactly. are exceeding you. That's why whenever when we came back from the wars, that's the, it was the soldiers who were the ones who were, who were targets of lynching. Mm -hmm. Because we represented, the soldiers represented black excellence. And mm -hmm. that's what white supremacy can't mm -hmm. stand. Mm -hmm. I think about how you're talking about, in the context of opportunities, James Brown said, I don't want nobody to give me nothing open up the door, I get it myself. Just get out the way. <laughs> you know, it, it, sometimes it's not opportunities we need. It is obstacles that we need you not to put mm. in our path when we're on our way to something. Because even though it may not be that we have learned the kind of behaviors that sets us on a path towards success, or aspiring to be successful in the society, there's something about us, you know, you can call it hustling if you want to. That's, what, that's a good word for it. It's called improvisation, like your improvisational <laughs> show. <laughs> we will make a way out of no way. Improvisation is our strong suit. That's jazz. And if you just leave us alone and don't put mountains in our path, we will find a way. We, we have always found a way. 
we find a way to take care of ourselves. We find a way to feed, you know, a house full of people on virtually no money. You know, we find a way to make it. It's called improvisation. We, <laughs> Jay Baruther said, God created hog intestines. Black people created chips. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Because even when we were given the scraps, that's right. We made them such that they were not only nurturing, but they were delectable. Okay. But the thing is, well, we made delicacies. That we, out of that. we improvisation is our strong mm -hmm. suit. If you do not have people changing the rules of the game in the middle of the game, if you do not have people slanting the playing field, see, it's, opportunity is one part of that issue. The other part of the issue is, you know, telling us to raise ourselves, lift ourselves by our bootstraps mm -hmm. when we're barefooted. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot do some things because you are forbidden or prohibited or somebody has put a millstone, a sack of millstones around your neck and where you would thrive or you would survive or you would make progress, you don't make progress Absolutely. because you are being restrained. We've been, the, what song said, I refuse to be held back anymore. You know, mm -hmm. we're being held back. Yes, we're being restrained. We're being restricted. So reparations, if you're going to, if you give us reparation, if we, if we are get, if we are given what we deserve, reparations, if we are under the same, if we have them under the same conditions, they will not benefit us to the extent that they should. Because well, if you put the same obstacles out there, if you put this, if you deny the same opportunities, we'll be back in the same position that we're in before you can blink an eye. Well, that that is that uh, that could be true, but um, what reparations would do is it would provide um, a, 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 um, a floor that would allow us not to fall uh, into into the edge of survival, to, to, to survival ethics. And when we're not living by survival ethics, we can we have a chance to develop that cultural capital, that, that ability to improvise, to, to, to improvise in a way that allows us to thrive uh, in, in, in despite the barriers that we have. Um, well, but you know, they as long as we're on the edge of survival, we, we won't be able to. Even the Nation of Islam, even um, Minister Farrakhan, had to try to import. Uh, the Dianetics, which is a, a, um, a technique from Scientology, uh, to, because we are, so many of us are damaged by our by our socialization process that we even when we have the opportunity we don't we don't take advantage of it. We're not we're not, we're not fully employing our psychic powers like we should, uh, and and uh, and that's what will I think uh, once we are no longer um, devoted or or or. Um, um, limited to, to survival ethics, we, we can do that. We can develop ourselves in a lot better and more fulsome way. Well, I support reparations. I do. I just, you know, I'm just one of these people who always raises questions. Good question. Because right? I think you raise the question so you can answer the question so you can succeed at what you're doing. So if you never consider what the obstacles are, what the considerations are, then you run up on them unprepared to meet them. That's right. But if you know that there will be resistance and you know that that resistance is deep-seated, intolerance. Deep-seated, very deep. For our people, then you understand that you've got, you've got to overcome that. You've got to transcend that. And sometimes you can do it with moral suasion, and other times you just have to have to just keep pushing with force so that you can achieve the goal. And sometimes when when people find out that when you have achieved a goal, it doesn't make a, di a difference of any 
uh, kind in their own lives, then they wonder why they were afraid in the first place. That's right. Because we're not, you know, we're not trying to re take them off the planet. Right, right. We're well, just what, what trying to of? find a place on the planet that we can, <laughs> we can occupy. Yeah, yeah, you got it exactly right. What are they afraid of? I mean, uh, facing up to, the, to their history, to the legacy of slavery, and, and, the, and, the, and the implications of what that legacy is, that, that should be, you know, uh, without question. Other